Hello, everyone, and welcome back. As always, I'm your girl, Candy Washington. And before we dive into today's episode, which is, you know, reviewing The Real Housewives of Salt Lake City, season four, episode 10, talking about the girls. And then I also want to bring up a couple of other things that are in the news, in the blogs about Monica, about Mary's son, and about, you know, what the girls are up to and what it's going to do. So before we dive in, go ahead and like, subscribe, and share. And as you come into the room, my beautiful candy canes, say hi in the chat box. Drop your candy canes. Where are you listening from? And what are your thoughts, questions, and comments about all things Real Housewives of Salt Lake City? So with that, let's dive right on in. So I thought this was a fun episode. I thought it was fun. It wasn't my most favorite episode of all time, but I did really enjoy it. I thought it, and then I think it's really good because it will be gearing up for the big Bermuda meltdown. And I really can't wait to see the messy scammer Monica get exposed. So one second, you guys. All right, you guys, and we're back. So I cannot wait for the Bermuda uh, meltdown episode. So I have a question. Do we need both Meredith and Angie K this season? Because I kind of feel like Meredith and Angie K give the same energy. They're both kind of flat. They're both kind of just there. They're both kind of, you know, a little blase, blase. Although I do think that Meredith surpasses her. Meredith gives, she has more of a dynamic with the women. She has better reads. She has better shades. But I feel like Meredith and Angie kind of have the same energy this season. Also, I think in this episode and going into Bermuda and the rest of the season, the alliances are also being exposed. I think the new alliance is going to be Heather Gay along with Lisa Barlow. And then I think that there are secret alliances. I think there's one between Angie Kay and Monica. And then I also think there's a secret alliance between Whitney and Angie Kay. So I'll do a deeper dive into why I think that when we get into everybody's slides. Okay, now let's move on to Miss Messy Monica. Number one, the whole scene with her mother was so scripted and so fake. You know, her mom bringing the Range Rover back. Monica weaponizing her children, being like, oh, is that grandma or mommy, whatever they call her? Is that gra- um, Is that grandma? Oh, lock the door. I don't want her coming in here. And then the kids pretending like they're scared of their grandmother when clearly they are not afraid of their grandmother. So that was obviously staged and coached. And then also how rude and how disrespectful Monica was toward her mother when her mother came to drop the car off. Number one, if I was her mother... I would not have given her the car back. I'm sorry, I wouldn't have done it. Not on my watch, not today, Satan. I would not have given her the car back because you're not going to clown me. You're not going to disrespect me. You're not going to have me stranded out here at um, Angie Kay's Easter dinner and then expect to drive the car that you only have because it's in my name, right? Hey, everybody. Hey, Miss T, what is up? Hey, Tay, Tay, Tay says Monica's a disrespectful, spoiled little brat. 100%. 100%. And I would not have given the car back. Now, let's talk about why didn't the mother call it an Uber? Because if you're bringing the car back and then Monica's not letting you, you know, have her daughter drop you off at home, production is not giving you a ride home because we're going to get into that. Hey, what's up? Hey, what's up, Chocolate Chunks? How are you, sweetheart? Um, you see what I'm saying? So why wouldn't you just call an Uber or a Lyft? I'm pretty sure the mom has it on her phone. So the whole, like, I'm going to walk home was very staged. And I don't think she actually walked home, but I'm get, but I do have an article. I want to read about that in a little bit to, cause Monica's mom, poor thing comes out and has to explain herself because she's so embarrassed and she's spilling the tea on what actually went down with Monica and that whole scene. Okay. Now, the way, to me, everyone's like, not my candy canes because you guys get it, but I have people in the comments like, you've never heard of a toxic mother. You've never heard of a narcissistic mother, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, of course. But to be honest with you, from everything I've seen, to me, it seems like Monica is the one who's the narcissist and she is the one who is toxic. Is her mother perfect? No, but nobody is. 
And it seems to me like her mother knows exactly who her daughter is. She knows she's a liar. She knows she's a scammer. She knows she's toxic. She knows she's unstable. She knows she's disrespectful. And to me, it seems like the mom is calling her an mf and all this stuff because at some point, I agree with the mom. She said, you're not on, we're not on the same level, Monica. I'm your mother. Monica treats her mother like she's beneath her, like she's some random chick in the street. There is no way in hell. I don't care how toxic I want to claim my mother is. I'm going to leave her stranded at a party. I'm going to disrespect her. And then I'm going to have her, quote, walk home. Just no way. It's too disrespectful. It is too disrespectful. Way too disrespectful. And then did you guys see how Monica was playing the victim to Meredith about Lisa, about the fight she had? She was like, oh, you know, Lisa said that like, because again, she's milking this whole BS storyline that her mom is so toxic and this, that, and a third. Oh, she said that, you know, my mom doesn't even want to raise me and blah, blah, blah. And Meredith, I believe, is seeing through her BS. And she was like, um, okay, well, try to respond and not to react. But Monica always plays the victim. And don't forget, Meredith wasn't at um, the Greek Easter party. So Meredith did not see firsthand just how disrespectful Monica was to her mother. Because don't because also remember, it wasn't this episode. I think it was ep- the episode before that or the one before that, right? When all the girls were, well, the majority of the girls were together. It was like Heather, Lisa Barlow, Meredith, And I forgot who was, I think it was Heather maybe, was saying how, was like catching Meredith up on what she missed because she wasn't at the Easter party. So she didn't see what happened. And I think it was Heather who was saying, oh, you know, Monica was saying like how her mom like takes away her car and and weaponizes her car when she doesn't have it. And then Meredith was kind of like defending Monica being like, oh, well, like she should get more responsibility and take that power back or something and all the other girls were like well no like you didn't see what happened like you don't, you're not gonna want to defend her on this one because Meredith wasn't there so Monica always tries to play the victim to get people on her side and twist different stories and everything that happens she's nothing but a big in my opinion egotistical spoiled brat narcissistic little girl little girl you see what I'm saying Now, let's talk about what's happening in the news. So as we know, Heather Gay is suing Monica for a measly $2,000 that Monica is refusing to to pay for her lip injections and nose injections. And then she's countersuing Heather Gay for $50,000 in damages. How does that make any sense? Your services were $2,000 that you're refusing to pay, but you're asking Heather to pay you $50,000? What damages? I've said this before. I think she's only countersuing because one, she wants Heather to drop the lawsuit. It's like a legal move. Think Erica Jane, we're appealing for legal reasons. So a lot of times people will countersue you when you're suing them as a way to get you to drop the case. Not because they actually have a valid case. You see what I'm saying? And then another thing is, if you're claiming that your nose job and your nose injections were, quote, botched, where are the receipts? Because I don't, I personally don't get injections or anything like that. But if I did and I felt my, and I felt it was botched, I'm taking photos, I'm taking evidence, I'm taking videos, I'm taking selfies, I'm calling Beauty Lab, like, yo, listen, you got me all the way effed up, my face is looking botched and crazy, you need to fix this, you need to comp me, you need to, ref- I'm not paying anything, you, A, you need to refund me, and B, you need to fix this, and I'm going to have a trail. I'm going to have emails complaining. I'm going to have my complaint with the Better Business Bureau. I'm going to have my photo evidence because when you feel like your face is botched, that's a big deal. So Monica, stop lying. This is what happened. You used your other name, Monica Fowler, from your first marriage. You went to Beauty Lab. You paid the little upfront money. You got the goods and services, and then you stopped payment on the rest that you owed. And then when Heather realized that Heather Fowler was the same person as Heather Garcia, who's been playing in her face all season, who's been acting like her friend all season, who turns out to be a snake in the grass, who who owes her company $2,000 or, 
yeah, $2,000, that's when Heather said, I'm going to sue you. So I'm team Heather all the way because it wasn't like she sued you out the gate. She sued you once she realized the scam that you were truly running. Because honestly, I think that if Heather Garcia hadn't come on the show and was playing in Heather's face like she was her friend, I think Beauty Lab probably just would have written off the 2000. Like that's not something you would really sue somebody over, you know, maybe like small claims or something like that. I don't think that Heather and Beauty Lab would have ever sued Monica if she was just a regular smuggler person who jumped out on on the bills over $2,000, you know? But I think she sued her out of principle at this point. Like you are on this show, you are playing in my face, like you're my friend. And the whole time you did me and my business and my livelihood dirty as hell. And Monica's only counter suing to save face, a botched face, girl buys, stop with the lies, stop with all of that. It makes zero, zero, zero cents. Um, so it came out that she also got, also in the news, that she got full custody of the kids and about a little over $6,000 a month in alimony and child support. Now, I have a couple of articles about Monica and her mom that I want to read for you guys. Let's first do a deeper dive into her divorce, alimony, child support, and all of that. Now, remember, if you guys were with me when we did our, our Miami recap, I was saying, you know, why is Lisa so excited that she's only that she's getting eight thousand dollars from Lenny every month for the kids and their preliminary? They haven't they haven't actually divorced yet. So that's just the preliminary amount. That amount most likely will change once the divorce is finalized. I hope it's higher. But if Mon if messy Monica over here is getting a little over six thousand, and then Lisa in Miami you know, married to Dr. Boobs and the plastic surgeon in their huge house is only getting about eight, is getting $8,000. That's a little bit the same, give or take like a, a thousand or 1500 or two, right? Because she's getting a little bit more than 6,000. So that's why I was like, this $8,000 would be, I mean, to us, our regular smuggler people, it's a lot. And we'd be like, okay, that's great. But to like these people, I was like, girl, what? Crazy. All right, but let's move on to... Monica's lies being exposed, exposed. So a lot of what Monica has said on the show has turned out to be blatant, bold-faced lies. The math isn't mathing, and now it's all coming out. So let's dive in. This is from Reality Blurb. It says, Monica Garcia's divorce from her ex-husband, Mike, has been finalized and the Real Housewives of Salt Lake City newbie has been awarded full legal and physical custody of their four kids. Just four months after Monica filed for divorce from Mike for a second time, a judge signed off on their split, finalizing the document on October 24th, 2023. Literally, that was two and a half weeks ago. Okay. In dealing Mike with a substantial amount of required support as his ex-wife was allowed to remain living in their Utah home. According to a November 9th report from the U.S. Sun, Mike, who currently resides in another state across the country, will be allowed to see his and Monica's four daughters, including Bree, Jaden, West, and Kendall, at reasonable times and places. This to me just sounds like, well, let me re read this other bit and then I'll dive into what I, to what I think is going on here. He'll also be able to spend time with them on holidays, including Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, New Year's Eve, and New Year's Day, while Monica will have them on Thanksgiving. Okay, let's break this down a little bit. So the reason why I think Monica got full custody is because she wants to be able to keep the kids in Utah and keep and, and keep all of the kids, even though her eldest daughter is from a, her previous relationship. She probably wants to keep all the kids together. So I think that's why she got full custody of the kids, because as it's stated, he doesn't even live in Utah. He lives across the country in another state. And then I think it's very normal that he's probably getting summers and holidays. That's pretty standard when one parent lives out of state. One parent gets summers and holidays. The other one gets the full custody, right? Now, I thought 
Let's keep going, and then I'm going to break down what's going on here. Okay, so although Monica has claimed to own a children's company, she said in court documents that Bria Baby has, quote, zero value at this present point in time, and that she does not have any countable income from any source. Meanwhile, Mike has a gross monthly income of $17,333. Due to his high salary, Mike was ordered to pay Monica $2,636 per month in child support until each kid turns 18 and $4,000 per month in alimony until June of 2037 or until Monica remarries or moves in with another partner. Listen, I thought that Monica and her husband were already divorced. Didn't she come on the show acting like she was divorced? Didn't she come on the show acting like the reason why she got divorced was because she was sleeping with her brother-in-law for 18 months? And that, you know, he flipped out and he had abandoned her and the kids? Isn't that how she came on the show? But it turns out that she literally only got legally divorced two and a half weeks ago. And she's been legally married to this man this entire time. So every single episode we have watched of Monica, she has been married. But she's sitting up there lying and saying she's divorced. Also, I'm confused. And I'm confused as to why the lawyers aren't doing their due diligence. She said she had zero income. Does Bravo not pay her? Because you filed for divorce. The divorce I just went through, she only filed that in June of 2023. She might as well have been still filming. And were they still filming in June? When did they go to Bermuda? March or May or something like that? You see what I'm saying? So you filed for divorce in June of 2023. I'm sure you've gotten some Bravo checks after you got paid for the show. So how are you claiming zero income? I'm pretty sure NBC Universal cut you a couple of checks for being a housewife on the show. So how are you claiming zero income? More lies, more lies, more lies. And I'm confused. How come his lawyer wasn't like, um, sweetheart, I'm looking at my television and I see you holding a snowflake. Are you holding the snowflake for free? So what, what's really good? Thought you were divorced. Thought it was because you were having an affair with your brother-in-law. And now you're claiming you don't make any money? I'm confused. I'm confused. Okay. As for their home, Monica will continue living in their four hundred, their four hundred and twenty-four thousand dollar three bedroom, two bathroom ranch style home in Kate in Kaysville, Utah, which has a one hundred and sixty-eight thousand dollar mortgage remaining. Monica was ordered to pay the mortgage because she was giving exclusive use and possession of the property, and Mike will receive one hundred and thirty thousand. $130,000 in equity, which will satisfy the lien. So that makes sense because, again, he doesn't live in Utah. So he's like, yeah, that's fine. You take over the house with the kids because that's where you all will be living. And I'm also confused. How come Monica keeps acting like she lives in the projects? Like she is so poor and broke, broke and destitute when she lives in almost a half a million dollar home? that she didn't pay for it. Now she has to make mortgage payments because now it's hers with the kids. But clearly Mike was the one who bought the house. And clearly he makes a lot of money. So I'm confused as to Monica's I'm so poor, I'm so broke storyline. You're living in a half a million dollar home. Your husband was making almost $18,000 a month. You were still legally married to, to this man up until two and a half weeks ago. So none of your story is making sense. Heather Gay was 100% correct when she said, don't believe a word that comes out of your mouth. Don't believe a word that comes out of her mouth. She was 100% correct. <sighs> Let's hear more lies. Following the finalization of their divorce, Monica celebrated in Las Vegas, where she attended BravoCon with her Real Housewives of Salt Lake City co-stars over the weekend. During an interview with E! News last month, Monica shared where she and Mike stand as co-parents. 
Because this is confirming what I said before. Monica was lying about seeing a, be, about being a single parent. And that pisses me off. Shout out to all the real single parents out there holding their children down. She says, he is a wonderful dad and provider, and we just weren't good together, and that's okay, she stated. He calls and checks on me. He'll see something in the news, and he'll get defensive and be like, that's not even true. Right, it's not true because she's a liar, and that's what you're seeing are the lies. So blame her, not us. I am the mother of his children and will always love and respect each other because of that. Didn't Monica act like she was abandoned by Mike? Didn't she act like she was the sole breadwinner for her and her kids? Didn't she act like he just got up and deserted them? But yet, last month, you're talking to E! News saying he's a wonderful dad and provider. And he is because you're getting over six grand a month for your children. You guys are staying in your family home. He's taking the kids on summers and, and holidays. And I'm not and I'm not giving him kudos for doing what he should do. You are a father to your children. You should take care of them. You should make sure the mother and the kids are good. So that's what you should do. So I'm not giving him praise for doing what he should do. What my point is, she's a liar. Trying to act like a victim, trying to lie and say she's a single mother. You're not a single mother. You're a woman who is very taken care of and you're co-parenting and you're co-parenting your children with what by all intents and purposes seems like a really good guy. You had sex with his with his sister's husband for almost 2 years. And he's still having your back. You're saying calling you and checking on you and defending you. That's a better man than me. I don't know if I could be married to someone who was having sex with my brother's wife for two years and then still be kumbaya with this person. So all I'm saying is that he he sounds like a really good guy. He sounds like a good father. It sounds like the, the custody situation is because he lives in a different state, not because he doesn't want to physically be there for his children. So again, you lied, playing victim. That's why I never believed a word you said about your mother, because you're doing the same exact thing. You wanted to be the victim. Oh, my uh, my ex, she kept saying that it was her ex-husband. They were still married. He abandoned me and the kids. I have to provide for the kids. That's a lie. He was still sending, sending you money because this is the thing. If the divorce just got finalized, just like what Lisa is getting in Miami, just like what um, Shannon got in the OC, just like how everybody gets, he is paying you preliminary child support and, and alimony prior to the divorce being finalized. So it's not like he wasn't paying for you and the kids. He clearly was. So you were up here lying this entire time. And now you're being, now you're talking out of both sides of your face. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I could have sworn Monica was acting like she was divorced and he abandoned her and the kids and she was a single mom holding down her family with whatever little Etsy shop she had going on. You know? Mm -mm 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 -mm. Okay, let's see. Let's see. What else is going on? The last bit of this. Okay. Whew. Monica married Mike in September of 2009 and filed for divorce in December of 2013. Then, after reconciling months later, Monica filed in June of 2023. I need that to be clarified and cleaned up. Did they reconcile months later in, in 2013? Or had they reconciled in 2023? Like they were just reconciled. Because it says then after reconciling months later, Monica refiled in June of 2023. Now, this is the gag. I don't think it's public yet, but it's about to be when is soon because Monica did an interview with People Magazine about this. What is the real reason why they got divorced? I mean, legally divorced. It's not because she had an affair with her brother-in-law for 18 months. Because if that was the case, they would have been legally divorced. Why did she file in June 
And why was it just legally finalized in October? What's the real reason why they got divorced? Maybe he met somebody else. I don't know. Maybe she did something. I don't know. Time will tell. But put it down below. Let me know what you guys think. Okay. Now, let's move on to Monica and her mom. Okay. So this is, I feel so bad for Monica's mom. She is just so embarrassed out here in these streets. She stays on Twitter. She stays on Instagram defending herself. Poor, poor thing. But she is speaking out and she's giving more clarity on what happened with, you know, Monica being, um, allegedly Monica tried to get military benefits illegally and all of that stuff. But let's dive into the latest drama between Monica and her mom and the rumors and the lies, okay? So this is from Reality Blurb. It says, Monica Garcia's mom, Linda, took to her Twitter account on Tuesday night to deny that she's a monster and accuse Monica of playing the victim. As you guys know, I side with Monica's mom on this. I think Monica is actually the biggest monster, the biggest narcissist, and she just is playing victim. 100%. As the latest episode of The Real Housewives of Salt Lake City saw Linda returning Monica's Range Rover after repossessing it, Linda reacted to a report claiming Monica attempted to get military benefits while also explaining why she took the car in the first place and sharing why production refused to give her a ride home after she dropped it off. So this is what's on the screen. This is a screenshot of um, the, the Twitter, the tweet thread. So someone says, please tell me you live down the block, a fan wrote, um, adding in a second message while wow, production couldn't even give you a ride. No, I asked, Linda confirmed. They said it was a liability issue, something like that. I was very upset. Look, you can't be mad at production for not giving you a ride when your own daughter wouldn't give you a ride. And I think the reason why production wasn't really trying to mess with Linda like that is because production's not stupid. They know Monica is a liar. They know Monica is a scammer. And they probably didn't want to run the risk of getting sued by Monica. See, there's an accident that happens or who knows. There is liability when you ride somebody in your car. Even just regular smuggler friends. When you get in an accident and you say you're hurt and you want to sue me or my insurance company, that could happen. So maybe she didn't sign a waiver. She didn't sign, I don't know, a contract or a release form. I don't know, but production was like, we're not getting involved. But why didn't she call an Uber or a Lyft? You see what I'm saying? And honestly, Miss Linda, if I were you, if I would have went and dropped the Range Rover off and I said, can you give me a ride home? And she said, no, I would have hopped my butt right the way back in the Range Rover and drove home and said, well, then you figure out how you're going to do it. I would not have taken that disrespect. You know, to be perfectly honest, Linda looked like the abused person in the relationship. You know, like think of, like think of it as like if Monica was a man and Linda was the um the battered wife. And I know that's very stereotypical, but I'm using that as an example because it's an easy one to reference. Linda to me seems more like the battered person, the more abused person than Monica does. Linda seems very afraid to speak up to Monica. She seems very afraid to piss her off. She walks around on tiptoes. She has to apologize for her. You know, she kind of walked away like, I'm giving a peace offering. Like, can we go to therapy? Like, Linda's giving battered wife, not Monica. While Monica just stood there with her arms crossed, giving her mother attitude. The stank look on her face. Monica did not look like anybody's victim to me. It really seemed like batter, battered mom syndrome or something like that. According to Linda, she took the Range Rover from Monica because Monica wasn't making prompt payments on the loan, which Linda says her name is still on. Now, this is some new juicy tea because I thought the reason why she took away the Range Rover was because Monica disrespected her at the Easter party and stranded her there. But if Monica, in alignment with her being a scammer and, you know, being known for not paying her bills, that's why Heather Gay is suing her right now for $2,000, for $2, if she wasn't making payments on the loan, which is in um, Linda's name, that could mess up Linda's credit. That's not going to hurt Monica by not making the, the payments. That's going to hurt Linda. 
So if that's the case, ugh, she re Linda really is the battered person. You're putting, you know, you know your daughter can't pay her bills and you're getting car notes in her name, risking your credit. No. If Monica wanted a Range Rover, she should have been able to qualify and make those payments timely and on her own, another Twitter user stated. It's unfortunate because you're being painted in a certain way. Monica and our production are helping you. I think this car is going to continue to strain you both. She also promised in the dealership that my name would be off in one year. It's been 26 months and my name is still on the loan, Linda noted. Of course, your name is still on the loan. The people at the dealership, they're not your friend. The people at the bank, they're not your friend. They're going to say anything for you to sign on the dotted line to get you to buy the car, to get you to get the money so they can get that interest rate and, and take your money. It's up to Monica to make it right. And as we know, Monica is a pathological liar and she's a thief. Did she steal Lisa Barlow's $60,000 ring? That's still up for debate. Some people say yes, some people say no. She sure as hell stole from Beauty Lab, didn't pay her $2,000 balance, and now she's trying to counter sue for $50,000? And what damages? Out here cussing your mother out, disrespecting her, playing victim, lying on your now ex-husband, making everybody think he was a deadbeat dad and that you're a single mom when you're not. He's not a deadbeat dad and you're not a single mom. You're a co-parent. You're a co-parent. Yikes. Another person suspected Lind Linda took Monica's car away to get her attention. Monica had not made an, an on-time payment in two years. Two years, not one, Linda replied. That's why they weren't taking Linda's name off the loan because the loan wasn't in good standing. Um, not one, Linda replied. The first time on payment came this year in October of 2023. I'm not playing this game anymore. I'm being maligned in the worst possible way. Poor Monica's mom. As for a report suggesting Monica had attempted to get military benefits and face legal action for doing so, Linda said that wasn't actually the case. Monica didn't claim to be a veteran, she clarified. The local car wash tried to sue Monica for a broken machine. She didn't do it. They dropped the suit case close. Okay. Also on Twitter, Linda, who previously accused the Real Housewife castmate member of, of bullying, defended herself against Monica saying that she's no monster and suggesting Monica made a habit of playing the victim. I'm not a monster. I was a great mom and a great bo uh, bobo, Linda shared. I, I think that's grandma. In episode two or three, Monica says what a blessing it is to have me three minutes away. That was the truth. Somewhere down the road, her story changes and I'm suddenly a monster. I'm not. Monica is a provocateur who pushes your buttons until she breaks you down, then cries victim. I forgive her. God bless. Exactly. That is a narcissistic person. They bully you until they break you down. And then when you pop off, they play the victim like they weren't the ones who broke you down to that place. Classic. And even though Monica is a bully and a narcissist and a selfish liar, Linda's still her mom. So she's trying to clear her name. But of course, she's still trying to protect her daughter. You know, Linda's out here like, listen, I'm just trying to let you know I'm not the monster and this is how my daughter is. But as a mother, of course, she's still trying to, of course, she's still trying to, um, you know, defend her, defend her daughter because that's her mother. And Lin Miss Linda, I'm telling you right now, you said, and all of a sudden I'm a monster. I have broken this down 15,000 times. I'll break it down one more time because you asked the question, Linda. I'm going to answer it for you. You said somewhere down there. Okay. You said in episode two or three, Monica says what a blessing it is to have me three minutes away. Yes. That was the truth. Yes. I agree 100% with you. This is what I said from day one. In the beginning of the season, it was very clear. Mo there was no problem with Monica and her mom. There was no problem with Monica and the grandkids or the, the grandmother and the grandkids, everything was cool, kumbaya. Then she says, somewhere down the road, her story changes and suddenly I'm a monster. I'm gonna tell you exactly where it went down the road. When Monica showed her ass at Angie K's Greek Easter party and lost her damn mind and her mask slipped and she was throwing shoes at kids, she was cussing you out, she was cussing Angie out and she lost her mind and she was worried she was going to be 
kicked off the show or iced out by the women and it wasn't a good look and she was worried about her position on the show, instead of saying, you know what, I had a temper tantrum, I acted wrong, I take accountability for my actions, she threw you under the bus and used you at the escape, escape boat, as the escape goat. That is the moment you're looking for. When you say suddenly down the road her story changes, that is the moment. The moment where she didn't take accountability for her own actions and instead said, my mom's a monster. She's so abusive. She abandoned me when I was 12 and we have this toxic relationship and I was just as confused as you were, Linda. But that's exactly what happened. We've talked about it a lot on the channel. So that is your answer, Linda. That's why she flipped on you because she didn't want to take responsibility for her piss poor behavior and she threw you under the bus. And now that she's done that, now she has to run with that narrative. Crazy. Crazy, crazy, crazy. So that is the deal. I want to know what you guys think when it comes to the military veteran benefits. Do you think Monica, because we now know she is a pathological liar and a thief, do you think, and a fraudster, do you think she really was trying to get the military or vet or veteran benefits or, you know, first of all, much love and respect to all of our active duty military and our veterans. Much love and respect to you all. Thank you for your service. Do you think Monica really was trying to get over and her mother is just trying to protect her? Or do you think it's something like what her mother said? It was like about a broken machine or something. I think her mother is just trying to protect her. That's what I think. But put it down below. Let me know what you guys think, okay? Now with that, let's move on to our next lady. So Miss Lisa Barlow. Now, I love that Lisa could not be bothered to pay Whitney any attention this episode. Like she just literally could not be bothered. Her shade about the cash bar and no food was classic. Um, now, let's talk about her singing at Heather's book signing. Number one, yes, her song was off key, but that was actually supposed to be like a bit. It was a shtick, but I don't think people got it. I think people thought that, now I'm not defending Lisa Barlow's singing capabilities. I love Lisa, but I'm, I'm rational, okay? But it was a bit. You know what I'm saying? She was a, she was supposed to be cringy. And then Heather's supposed to come out and be like, can I get an amen? And then have everybody come in. But I don't think it landed. I think people thought that was Lisa Barlow really trying to sing like that. Now, don't trust Angie, Lisa. She is a low-key, high-key Lisa hater. Don't forget that it was Angie K, Angie H, Whitney, that Dana girl, and Heather Remember when they tried to do that Lisa takedown? It was, I think it was like a couple seasons ago about catering gate when they tried to say, oh, Lisa called the catering people and told her not to cater um, Angie, Angie H's event because Angie and Whitney were friends. Remember all of that? And that, that whole situation, that whole scandal going on about, oh, she's telling people not to work with us and she's trying to sabotage our events and blah, 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 blah which A, I really don't believe. I don't think Lisa Barlow could be bothered with all of that stuff. Don't forget that core group. The head of it was, An yes, the head of it was Angie H because Angie K is a beta B, but Angie K was a part of that group. And remember when Whitney was trying to take it down um, and Lisa was like, why are you all of us, uh, why are you now to Angie Harrington? She was like, why are you all of a sudden saying you're cousins with Whitney? When I had never heard of this, why are you siding with her? Because I think Angie Harrington was doing a behind the scenes campaign to, re I think she wanted to replace Lisa Barlow. She thought she should have been the HBIC on the show. That she wanted to replace Lisa Barlow and get all her minions in on it as well. Heather Gay was in on it. Whitney was in on it. All of them were in on it. Don't forget about that. Angie K to me is spineless. She is not your friend, Lisa. I'm telling you, don't trust her. That's why she's so two faced and wishy washy and trying to set you up with stuff and trying to set you up. Don't trust her. She's not your friend. She was in on the okie doke. Okay. 
And I know that there has been stuff going around about Lisa Barlow's son, Jack, about where he is um, stationed for his mission. I'm not going to say where they're saying he was stationed for the missions because I'm not going to dox someone when they're on a mission and everything. It's now saying that, like, no, he really is still going to go to Columbia. And I can say Columbia because they said it on the show, and, but that he was working out his visa. I personally, to be honest with you, I personally was like, well, good on Lisa for keeping her son in a safer city. You know, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. If she wants her son to, to stay in a safer city, then hell yeah, stay in a safer city. You know, whether he's working out his visa and then he's going to go to Columbia, I don't know. But if he can stay in a safer city, then stay in a safer city. Obviously, that is no disrespect to Columbia or to any area like that. Obviously, no disrespect. But I'm just saying, if you can keep your children safe, you want to keep them safe. So I was, my mind was blown when I was seeing all these people being like, oh, Jack's not in Columbia. He's actually here. And again, I'm not going to say where he is. I'm not going to dox him. He's actually in this state, blah, 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 blah. How is he? And I'm just like, first of all, he's still a child. He just graduated out of high school, about to go into college or, you know, on the mission. He's still a kid. Like if he wanted to stay in a safer city, if she wanted to protect her child, let her. I just thought it was very shady and very like, please have some boundaries, people, when it comes to this. And why would you try to use that as a way to go after Lisa? She's just a mom trying to protect her children. You know, like people need to stop. They really, really do. They really, 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 really do. Okay, now let's move on to Angie K. Angie K is like I said, she's two-faced. She wound Lisa Barlow up about Monica, and then she turned on her when Lisa had her back. Now, Lisa didn't like Monica anyway. I'm not saying Lisa liked Monica and then stopped liking her because of Angie. I'm just saying that Lisa thought she had a friend in Angie and a common enemy in Monica because of what Monica did, talking about um, the rumors about Angie's husband. We know what the rumors are, his sexuality and cheating and all of that stuff. And Lisa is kind of like, I'm confused. You know, when you're in my face, you would want nothing to do with Monica. You know, Monica really betrayed you. You know, she really came for your family. She's the one who said it on camera. She brought it to the show. And all of a sudden now you're taking her side when she's attacking me. I think Lisa Barlow is very valid in that. I would feel some type of way too. But that made me think, does Angie and Monica have a secret alliance off screen? Because we know these housewives, they always have secret alliances and packs off screen. Because that, would, that makes sense now why Angie was so quick to forgive Monica. We had a conversation and she apologized and it was cool. Okay, what? You are still going so hard for Meredith. You had all the smoke for Meredith today when Meredith actually never said any rumor about your family, but you're still going after her still. You didn't get your fill in Palm Springs like I'm like a freaking fool, but yet you are kikiing and laughing and siding with Monica and so quick to forgive her when she actually said it on camera. And the gag is the rumor Monica said on camera wasn't even the rumor that Meredith was referring to. And you know this, Angie. So why are you so quick to forgive and to be on Monica's side when she threw your entire family under the bus, but yet you want, but yet you have no problem um, being wishy-washy to Lisa and you're still at all the smoke for Meredith is it because you and Monica have an alliance? That's what I really think is going on. I think they have a secret alliance. I don't trust Angie. Something is very weird to me. When it comes to her and her husband, I think they have an arrangement. They have an agreement. I think that they are best friends who are choosing to co-parent their child and do life together. I don't think he's, quote, cheating. I don't think she's, quote, cheating. I think they just have an understanding. And that's fine. I don't judge people's lifestyles. However you want to govern your life, however you want to govern your marriage, that is your business. But it doesn't make any sense how she's kikiing with what's your face, um, Monica, unless they have a secret alliance, right? And like I mentioned earlier, don't forget about that group. 
It was the Angie Harrington group, the Whitney, Dana, Heather, Angie K group that wanted to do the Lisa takedown. And then the other season, it was the Jin Shaw takedown. Remember when Angie Harrington and her husband did that um, Instagram account, Shaw Exposed? Because they wanted to, you know, get um, Jen Shaw taken out. They couldn't wait for, you know, the lawyers to send her to prison. They wanted to kick her out. They were all in that group. And then don't forget, Bonica was Jen's assistant until she turned state's evidence and became, a, and became a witness. So I don't trust Angie. I think she's playing quiet. She's playing like, oh, Lisa, I'm so scared of you. But she was a minion right in those groups, all of the groups that had secret alliances trying to take down Jen, trying to take down Lisa and all of that. So I wouldn't, be, and, but that group broke up, right? Very similar to the Fox Force 5. When Heather and Whitney started, you know, bad weather broke up, that broke up the group. When Angie Harrington decided not to come back to the show, that broke up the group. So I do think the group has, the group has broken up, but that doesn't mean that the members themselves hasn't gone into secret alliances. And now it seems to me that it, there's a, an alliance between Angie and Whitney, and there's also an alliance between Angie and Monica. Because if you also think about it, how come Whitney is team Angie? I think Angie is so scared of you, Lisa. She just can't talk to you, Lisa. You know, Angie's just, has she ever, you know, gone against you, Lisa? Like, shut up, Whitney. Why are you, like, buffing up Angie? I'm more mad at you, Lisa. Ridiculous. So I think that there are some secret alliances going on. However, I think when Monica gets exposed for what she did to Beauty Lab and probably some other stuff coming out, then I think Angie and Monica's alliance will probably fold because Angie's going to save herself rather than go down with Monica. But I do think that there are some secret alliances going on. And that's why you see no matter what happens, very similar to Fox Forest 5 and Beverly Hills, no matter what happens, it's, oh, I forgive you. We're cool. We're good with certain people. But with other people, they, you know, have a grudge until the freaking cows come home and they run it in and run it in and run it in and run it in and run it in. And they do these like smear campaigns and narratives because certain people have alliances to protect each other and certain people don't. It's very, very clear. Very, very clear. Okay. So let's move on to Miss Whitney. Whitney is so annoying and self-righteous and just doofy. Whitney is like so doofy to me. Like the way she talks, I I just feel like she literally doesn't think before she talks. Like as she's talking, the words are literally forming in her mouth. There was like no forethought. It's ridiculous. She's the type of person who went to like one therapy session or she went to like one, like, you know, Joshua Tree, ayahuasca, meditation se like session. And now all of a sudden she thinks she's a wellness guru. Girl, bye. She weaponizes therapy speak. We don't have those words in our house. We have boundaries. And, you know, we need to just, my trauma, blah, blah, blah. You're just projecting. Like she weaponizes therapy speak. You're nobody's guru. You're nobody's life coach. Okay, sweetheart. I have a self-care podcast. I'm way better than you at it, Whitney. Okay. I'm not a guru by any means. I am not a life coach by any means. So girl, sit down, be quiet. She is still very jealous of Lisa and she needs to have several seats. And like I was saying on Angie K's slide, I do think she has an alliance with Angie K to have each other's back and to not expose each other. That's why she was going so hard for Angie and the rumors when Meredith brought them up. But then she got shook when Monica said it on camera about um, Angie's husband's sexuality and cheating. Because you could see on um, Whitney's face, she wasn't expecting that. She was like, wait, what? She was like, I didn't even, she was like, wait a minute. And she, did, she wasn't expecting it because she thought she was throwing Meredith under the bus. Because if you go back and really watch, the real person who is at fault for the rumor getting out is Whitney. Because Whitney was going hard. I can't believe Meredith said that. We have, to, we have to talk to Angie. We have to protect Angie. Meredith is going after the family. What did she say? And remember, Whitney was the one who got Lisa Barlow involved. And then they brought over Monica 
And then Monica was the one who said it. And Whitney looked shook because Whitney thought she was throwing Meredith under the bus. And I don't think Whitney expected to come out of Monica's mouth what came out of it. Because remember, what Monica said is not what Meredith was actually referring to. I think Whitney knew what Meredith was referring to. And that's why she was shocked when she heard what Monica said, because they were two different things. That's another reason why I think Whitney and Angie K are in an alliance. Why was Whitney going so hard against Meredith being like, oh, we don't want to talk about the husbands. It's really Whitney's fault. Why it got out because she was pressing it and pressing it and pressing it. And Monica was like, oh, I'll talk. I'll spill the beans. I'll be a plant. I'll do it. Whatever. No big deal. Right? Crazy. And I think she was trying to um, bolster up Angie by going after Meredith. And then it backfired. Now, there's definitely trouble in her marriage with Justin, and I get it. Whitney is super annoying. To be honest with you, if I was Justin, I'd be kind of done with her too. That's just me. Just keeping it all the way real. And then um, when Lisa said to her, I'm going to tell you exactly how I feel so no one has to guess, I screamed. I shrieked. And I was like, exactly, because isn't this exactly what I have been saying for years about Whitney and Heather? I have been saying this forever. Whitney and Heather, not so much Heather anymore, but when they were bad weather, Whitney now still, but Heather Heather has turned to leave. Heather has kind of seen the light. But they would create stories in their heads, in their minds, and then they would repeat it back to the group as if it were fact. Like, well, this is why Lisa said this. This is why Meredith did this. Remember, they caused all that drama about um, when Meredith's father passed away, about whether or not she was actually having the memorial and whether or not she was really there. And it was all semantics and a misunderstanding. And they tried to make it out like Meredith was lying about the father's memorial and all of that. And it was just like, no, girl, you made up the story in your mind. And then you repeated it to everybody else as if it were fact. And now you have all this drama and chaos going on because you lied. And so when Lisa was like, I'm going to tell you exactly how I feel so you don't have to guess. I was like, thank you. I have been saying that for years. For years, they have caused so much chaos and drama and confusion. Shout out to Vicki Gunvalson. (laughs) Drama, chaos, confusion. Shout out to her. Because they do that. You know who else does that? Gina and Emily on the OC. Tweedledee and Tweedledum get together. They create conspiracy theories in their head. And then they go back and repeat it to other women as if it were fact. And then the two people are now fighting over something they made up in their head. Absolutely ridiculous. Like when Emily was like, oh, um, Heather told me that uh, Shannon was talking about me at BravoCon. That was a complete lie. It was Tamara. Emily was too drunk to even remember, but Gina remembered and sat there and didn't say anything. You see, that's what they do. It's absolutely ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. And can we stop talking about your prism line? I'm sorry, but like, like Lisa said, like if you didn't have a cash bar and you had some food, like nobody cares about your influencer event. It was a glorified social media campaign. You don't actually design it. It's not actually your brand. You're just the face of it. You're basically like an influencer. Nobody cares. Let it go. You had a beat. You had a moment. Nobody cares. What happened to your skincare line, Whitney? I'll wait. What happened to it? Thought you spent hundreds and thousands of dollars buying out your partner and rebranding it. Where is your event for your skincare? Can I buy it? Where is it? Do you even use it? I'm confused. Where's your skincare line? Girl, bye. Girl, bye. Okay. Now let's move on to Miss Heather Gay. So I'm actually really liking Heather this season. She's a little fresher, um, at least in these last in this last episode. You know, I'm really liking her more. I think she's more grounded. She's not doing the absolute most the way she w- usually does. I do think the book signing event was a vibe. I was here for it. And I was happy to see her and Lisa come to an understanding because Heather making her jealousy of Lisa a personality type, I was tired of it. I was tired of it. And I think it's going to be more fun seeing them as friends than seeing them as frenemies. It's going to add a lightness. It's going to add um, 
just more fun to the show. You know, we don't need people at each other's throats for no reason every single scene. It'll be good to have beats and moments and comedy and friendship and fun and lightness. So I think it's going to be a lot better, a lot lighter, a lot more fun when the ladies are getting along and there's not this unnecessary tension for no reason. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing the Bermuda trip meltdown where she exposes Monica for not paying her beauty lab and laser bill. And not looking forward as like I'm taking joy in it, but you know what I mean? Like for, you know, the, the understanding of everything going down. I think the show, I think that the past four episodes, they've been okay. They've been, you know, setting up episodes. I'm ready for the juice. I'm ready for it to get good. I'm ready for, you know, a little bit of the judging, you know, I'm ready for some juice. And I think once we get to get to Bermuda and all of the fallout, we're going to get to the juice and it's going to be juicier and a little bit more energy, a little bit more life into the show because it's good, but it's not giving, if you know what I mean. So I think it's going to really get some more juice after the Bermuda trip and I'm looking forward to it. She was so uncomfortable at Mary's house. I would be too. It's like a haunted house. There's probably skeletons and demons and evil vibes running around that house. I would be too. Mary is an absolute mess. But um, but yeah, I'm, I'm feeling Heather. I'm feeling Heather. I really liked her. I loved her event. I loved um, the excerpt that she read from her book. I thought it was a really good expert, um, excerpt from the book. Um, and yeah, and I'm happy that she took a little bit of accountability, you know, being like, you know, Lisa, I need to be more open to what your experience is. And I want to be a part of, you know, Jack going away, not because I want to criticize you, but because I have a different perspective on it. And I think um, with Lisa hearing that, she was kind of like, okay, well, phew, you know, I've been so concerned about my son leaving, knowing that you're not going to be against me. It feels better that you can be a part of that experience with me as a form of support. Because quiet as it's kept, I don't think Lisa wants him going on no mission. I don't think she wants him actually indoctrinated into the Morgan faith. I think she just wants him to have that Barlow last name, but to be a person of the world, just like she is. You know what I'm saying? So I think that really softened her up. And I'm happy to see that more. And I do love Lisa, but I do think she needs to step back a little bit and not let these girls rally her so much. She needs to let it, you know, kind of not be so bothered by it, you know? Because I think when Monica coming after her, she's really bothered by it. When Heather goes after her, she's really bothered by it. And I think that if you're truly going to be that it girl, the best thing about an it girl is that she's unbothered. She's unbothered. Because it's like, oh, sweetheart, like you're trying, that's cute. So I think that she needs to stop letting people like Monica get such a rise out of her. She's a bit of a thicker skin, you know? So I, I do think that about her, but I'm happy to see them getting um, along better. Okay, now let's move on to Meredith. Now, Meredith and Seth's podcast, if you guys remember when we did Married to Medicine, and speaking of Married to Medicine, I think I'm going to start reviewing it. I did a poll and the community tab. It's about 50-50, but I got a lot to say. I got a lot to say about Mary to Medicine. So I'm thinking I'm gonna start reviewing it. Let me know if you guys want me to. But do you guys remember last season with Mary to Medicine? We were talking about it. And Dr. Simone and her husband were writing their book, like their marriage book, like, oh, we almost divorced, but we stayed together. Let's write a book to help people. This is exactly what I said, exactly what Seth and Meredith are doing. I said, don't write a freaking book. <laughs> you need to do a podcast. And then in every single episode, you are either shooting a scene for the podcast, you're interviewing your friends for the podcast, which is what they're going to do. They're going to have Whitney and Justin on the podcast next episode, but you should just do a podcast. And so by the, so by the time the season airs, your podcast is launched, you have some um, episodes in the bank, and people can now go listen and download to your podcast in real time. And then from the podcast, you can sell your courses or your merch or your liquor or your jewelry or whatever it is, because you always use whatever platform you have to sell your merchandise. That's just how, you know, marketing and economics and it, that's how it all works. You know, think about Taylor Swift. When she goes on tour, the tour is the platform. She's making her money from merchandise. 
from t-shirts and friendship rings and hoodies. You know, musicians like, you know, musicians make their money off of merch. Think about athletes. Their platform is the field, but they're making money off of memorabilia, wearing a jersey, get the hats, get the boots, get the, you know what I mean? So every person who has a platform, whether it's a podcast or a YouTube channel or a TV show or a tour or the football field, they're always selling something else. And that's where the bulk of the money comes from. And that's why I was like, why are you writing a book? Nobody's going to buy your stale, funky book. And like, that's what um, Amorosa told them too. She's like, why are you writing a book? Number one, you guys are going to get divorced because you guys are fighting over it. And two, who writes a book? So as we now know in Married to Medicine, they're no longer writing the book. But we'll talk about that when we get to when we review Married to Medicine. But what Meredith and Seth are doing on their podcast is exactly what I said Dr. Simone and her husband should do. Do the podcast. Film it, film the, shoot the podcast during filming and then have it launched when it's airing and then you can sell your stuff through it. So that's what they're doing. And I'm, and I'm here for it. I'm here for the podcast. I want to listen to it. I want to know what happens. But again, very similar to a lot of marriages on these TV shows and a lot of marriages in real life. I think they have an arrangement. I think they have an agreement. I think at this point in their lives, they're more like brother and sisters and they are co-parenting their children. And it's easier to stay together than separate. I think that they are at, in, I think in reality, they're probably living pretty separate lives. You know, he's always in a different state and she's wherever she is, but they want to keep the business and the family persona. They want to stay on the show. They want, you know, the optics of being a married couple. You know, they want that prestige of what, what that still brings people of having that look. But I think the reality is, is that Seth has been doing him. Meredith has been doing her. But I think when it probably started, it probably was cheating. Just like she said, I thought you were going to leave me and I was scared. I think it probably was him probably cheating on her from what it sounded like and him living his own life and leaving her to raise the kids. And he would just, you know, send the check home, live his life, do him. And she was sit there, and she was there raising the kids. I bet that's how it started. That's very toxic. It's very unhealthy. It's very sad. Very low, very, very, very lonely. But I think it evolved over time to, well, you know what? We may no longer be in love with each other, but we have these children and we have these businesses. And, you know, unless you want to marry somebody else, there's really no reason to actually get divorced at this particular time. Let's just, you do you, I do me, don't embarrass me, we're good. You know, and I'm okay with that. Like I said before, I don't judge how people choose to live their lives, right? Um, I loved her vibe against Angie K and is paying her dust. Angie is so flat and she is so boring and I just cannot with her. Like I literally cannot. I, I, I cannot. Angie needs to go. Angie needs to go. Um, but I would also like to see more of Meredith engaging this season. She hasn't been around that much. She's talked about her jewelry. She's talked about the podcast. It's her versus Angie K, but I want to see Meredith a little bit more engaged. So hopefully as the season continues, she will be more and we'll see more of her because I, I, I want to. I want to. All right. Now let's move on to Mary Cosby. Now I was a bit torn about whether or not I was going to report on this, her son and all of his, you know, um, illegal substances and DUIs and criminal charges. I was a little torn if I was going to um, report this because I was like, well, it's her son. And that's like a big, you know, thing with substance abuse and addiction. But then I was like, I give the smoke to everybody else's child when they mess up. We talked about, um, is her name Brianne? Kim Kim Zolzak's daughter, Zolziak's daughter, whatever her whole name is. When Brianna, when she got a DUI, we talked about it. You know, we talk about all of the kids who are on the show when they get in trouble. So I was like, you know what? What's good for the goose is good for the gander. So here we go. Here we go. So first of all, Mary is dark and evil as hell. So please leave Heather alone. And why is Mary even still on the show at this point? Do you think she's going to be brought back? I really hope not. Because what I'm referring to is remember in the confessional when Mary was like, oh, Heather wants to still have church and community and God, but then she still wants to do her dark stuff. And I'm like, Mary, you are the darkest soul on that show. And I don't even really like half the women on the show, but you are the darkest soul on that show. 
I think the, the biggest person who should be worried about their relationship to God is you, Mary, because you're trying to act like God and you're trying to play God. So you better be careful. You're the darkest person on that show. And she definitely enables her son's problematic behavior. You know, she seems to be completely checked out of reality in general and then checked out of his life in particular. Like, why are you on the show asking your son if he's married or not? That is wild to me. And then you're clearly, you know, subsidizing his life financially. He still lives in the home with you, with his, I guess, wife. And you clearly pay for their existence. I don't know what job he has. But at the same time, it's like, what chance did this guy have? He's the product of, of a mother and his what would have been his step-great-grandfather is the person he calls dad. So that right there is setting you up to having some type of emotional and mental issues. Do I call you great-grandfather or do I call you daddy? That is a lot of stuff. Not to mention everything with Mary's family. You know, the suspicious death of her grandmother, stealing the businesses, stealing the money, stealing the churches, the suspicious death of church members, stealing from the congregation, all of that stuff. The allegations of it being a cult, of Mary, of Mary wanting people to worship her as if she were a god. There's a lot going on. And Mary Cosby is a loony freaking tune, completely checked out of reality. And so it doesn't seem like she's really that tuned into him but then at the same time she seems to have a very enmeshed relationship with him like like in a lot of codependent dysfunctional relationships it's like she is married to her son not in a sexual way but very similar to what we talked about with um alexia and her son peter with the real housewives of salt lake city where the mother thinks that her son is her partner she pays for him. She enables him. He can do no wrong. No one is good enough. She's always there for him. She's coddling him. He never has to grow up. Peter Pan syndrome, where instead of equipping their children to be adults, they enable they enable them to be um, infantile, to be children their whole lives, right? And I think there's a very similar dynamic going on with Mary and her son, where she enables a toxic behavior you know, didn't even know he was married and he's getting DUIs. And then to me, this is a cry for help because you can't be that dumb posting weapons and illegal substances on your public Instagram and Snapchat and Snapchat, Snapchat accounts. Wherever he was posting this stuff, I'm not putting it on my channel. I saw the photos. If you want to see the photos, Google it. I'm not putting it on my channel. But like, this is either a cry for help because nobody's that dumb. Even if it's a private account, nobody's that dumb to post it. I guess maybe, but nobody I know. But let's get into more of the details, okay? These are exclusive details from Raider Online. It says, Real Housewives of Salt Lake City star Mary Cosby's son accused of driving under the influence and possessing marijuana during a 2020 encounter with police. Over the past couple of weeks, Robert Cosby, who is 20 years old, not even old enough to drink yet, has caused concern with disturbing posts on social media. One image showed Mary's child holding a Mary Jane and another unidentified pills in his mouth. In 2021, Mary and her son Robert faced Mary and her son Robert faced criminal charges for allegedly providing shelter to a runaway and contributing to the delinquency of a minor. The alleged offense took place on April 8th of 2021, according to local reports. Sources claimed the mother of Robert Jr.'s girlfriend called the police. Side note, I would call the police too. If my daughter was like, I'm going to go hang out at Mary Cosby's house and pop pills and smoke and drink and do lean with her son, I'd call the, I'd call, I would call the police too. Yikes. The mother was reportedly upset that her child had been staying at Mary's home. I would be upset too. Robert and Mary pleaded not guilty to all charges. The case was eventually dismissed by prosecutors in February of 2022. This is another reason why Mary didn't come back to the show. 
Not because she didn't want to deal with the women, not because she was afraid to see them at the reunion. Mary didn't want the smoke for all of the skeletons coming out about her her shady business, her shady church, her grandmother's death, her and now her her child's, you know, DUIs and you know, illegal substances and weapons and all this stuff. Mary didn't want the smoke. She didn't want the smoke. Mary spoke out after the charges were dismissed. She said, I don't live my life to please people. I live my life to please God, to the people who are committed to believing lies. Radar has uncovered additional court records that show Robert had a run-in with the law in 2020. The situation was first reported on Starcasm. On December 12th, 2020, Robert was pulled over for a traffic violation. The police came to, claimed Mary's underage son was driving under the influence and was found to have Mary J. Spice on him. In addition, prosecutors claim Robert was driving without a valid driver's license. In March of 2021, Robert Jr. reached a plea deal with the government. He agreed to plead guilty to driving under the influence and, other, and the other charges were dismissed. The court sentenced Robert to 180 days in jail with 178 days suspended. So basically, he spent um, two days behind bars and he got to go home. Um, he was allowed to complete 48 hours of community service in lieu of two days behind bars. So we actually didn't even spend two days behind bars. He did two days of community service. That's a very, who was Mary paying off? That's a very privileged, you know, sentence, you know, for being found driving under the influence as a minor without a valid driver's license. We talk about white privilege, but there's also green privilege. And by green privilege, I mean, when you have the money to pay people, you get lighter sentences, you get a slap on the wrist. You know, there's also green privilege. And as we know, Mary has a lot of people's money. I don't know how she got all her money, but she has a lot of money. And there's also green privilege. You see what I'm saying? Whew. Robert was also ordered to pay fines, complete 12 months probation, and attend a victim impact panel. Mary has not spoken about the arrest. Mary is married to her late grandmother's second husband, Robert Cosby Sr. The two have been the two have been together for 20 years. Again, I don't even think that's a real marriage. That to me was a business deal. That was nothing but a business deal. I don't even think he lives lives with her. In that house, if he does, he has his own wing and they don't ever talk. Oof. They only have one son, Robert Cosby Jr. I wonder if they did the deed to get the son or if it was like some, you know, in vitro situation. Recently on Real Housewives of Salt Lake City, Mary found out her son had been secretly married for a year. For a year. And that's what I was talking about. She's checked out in general and reality but then she's also checked out in particular in her son's life. Yikes. But I want to know what you guys think. Put it down below. Do you like Mary? Do you find her evil and insufferable? Or do you think she's funny and shady? And what do you think is going on with her son? You know, he's not even legal age yet. He's 20. Can't even drink yet. And he's already been arrested. He's already been um, having DUIs. He's been married secretly for a year at least. And he was harboring a girl who ran away, you know, posting pictures of weapons on his social media campaigns, along with lean, like cough syrup and all of these prescription pills and Mary Jane. Like, do you think this is a cry for help? I'm concerned. I think it's very scary. And what do you guys think about the relationship between Mary and her son? Is it codependent? Is it unhealthy? Is she enabling his toxic behavior, put it down below and be sure to like, subscribe, and share. So with that, you guys, I'm going to drop the link in case anybody wants to come up. But of course, I'm going to take your candy cane questions and comments in the meantime. And I'm also going to take a swig of water because I've been talking for a very long time. <laughs> okay, here we go. All right. Okay, now let's get to your candy cane questions and comments. All right. Hey, 